Amen. Today we are going to be on part two of our series of 18 weeks going through the Bible narrative, okay? And so today we are on the fall. We're going to be talking about the effects of the fall and how though we are saints in Christ, but actually we are dealing with a sinful condition and a fallen nature, okay? So today is about saints and sinners. Speaking of which, how many of you managed to catch Yannick Sinner winning uh, the Australian Open? Yep, yeah. Okay, different kind of sinner they were talking about here today, okay? Yeah. All right. Bible series 4. How many of you know, right, that last week we went through uh, creation, right? We saw how God created and then very quickly, just as quickly as He created or what it feels like in the way the story is told, right? Everything falls apart, okay? And this everything falling apart here, okay, kicks start or it just sends all of our created world spiraling into an out of order, uh, um, chaotic kind of like uh, um, uh, attempt to find its grounding, find its way, fumbling around in the dark. And God will, over many occasions, come in to rescue, reset, send them along, decay, gone wrong all over again, and on and on it goes, okay? Um, I, will, I will do a more complete um, overview um, in, the, in the weeks to come, but I, but I think that many of you have already heard, right, how I do an overview with this one, the entire Bible narrative. From creation to fall, resets, then God gives a promise, then He raises up tribes, He exodus, brings them out of Egypt, conquest to take land, chaos ensues when people do their own thing. He gives them kings and prophets to draw the kings back. Eventually, they collapse as a nation. They go into exile, but they return back after 70 years. They wait and anticipate for the coming of Messiah. Jesus comes to be a king with a kingdom that has arrived. He saves the people on the cross, and therein is birthed the church, and it will go on like this until the apocalypse. But today, we are at the fall, all right? And I can't start this any other way than to read you the account of the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that Yahweh Elohim had made. That's the name of God, okay? Yahweh Elohim, okay? He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it or you will die. So at this point, Eve seems to be clear about God's instruction. God had, in fact, said, you can eat of any of the trees in the, in the garden, but you cannot eat from that one tree, right? Or you will die. No! And, I, and this is the CSB translation. It renders it with a no exclamation mark, right? Um, uh, some of the older translations are rendered as like, surely not, or something like that. But no, it's like, wow, startling when I saw it. No! You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, this fruit, just want to spend a bit of time, okay, to help us understand. If you don't have a church background, you have not been in church for much, you might have seen it represented as an apple, okay? And you might have been told that Adam and Eve ate the apple 
apple. It is not an apple. Okay, it's just a simplification made probably for for Sunday school children um, because I guess apple looks red and seductive. And then and then what's worse is after that you watch you know, Snow White and then you and after that it's like yeah that apple that forbidden fruit you bite it the poison you die right. By the way, that is a parallel. Okay, now it is not an apple. It is the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree is called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Hey, what fruit is this? Uh, what fruit is this? D durian? No, no, no. It's not durian. Okay, it's not durian because you and I... <laughs> durian is halal in the garden of Eden. <laughs> ah, oh boy. Oh, boy. Good... Up, up, up. Going in so good, coming out though. No. Coming out though. No. Not quite so good, right? Right? Oh boy. All right. Now, what is this fruit though of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I think sometimes we think about this fruit as um, so they eat, then they, they know. They know what is good. They know what is evil, right? Um, and then suddenly it's like a... I don't know how you imagine it. Maybe it's so conceptual. Maybe it's so abstract. You don't even bother imagining it. It's just like poison. You eat, you die, right? But maybe I can help you think about the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil this way. Where, because now the clue is here, right? It says that... Now, we should take everything the serpent says with a pinch of salt, okay? He says that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, okay? You will be like God. Now, it is not entirely untrue that when you eat of it, that is becoming a kind of a counterfeit likeness of God. And then uh, God actually says later, okay, that now that they have eaten it, they are, you know, in the, the expression, in some translations, it's like us, right? Okay? And so, but to know good and evil can be thought of in this way. And I think this is a helpful way to think about it. The knowledge of good and evil is like self-determination as to what is good and what is evil. So, by the way, self-determination is not like I'm very determined, you know, to do something good for myself. That's not what it means, okay? Self-determination means I'm going to decide for myself how I live my life. So when Malaysia, so it's a neutral term, okay? When Malaysia gained independence in 1957 from the British crown, okay? We became a self-determining state, right? We appoint our own heads of state, we have our own parliament, and so on and so forth. We become self-determining. They don't control us, we control ourselves. The knowledge of good and evil in this context is a bit like saying, I now am a self-determining autonomous Adam and I am a self-determining autonomous Eve and we shall decide what is right and wrong because, here the knowledge of good and evil, I know what is good, I know what is evil. I don't need you to tell me what is good, what is evil. I know what is good. I know what is evil. Okay? And therefore, I set the benchmark for what morality is. Today and the whole of human history, people have decided for themselves what is right, what is wrong. We set the new trend in ethical you know, standards that these days, this is what is right and wrong, right? And so, my friends, if you trace back history of right and wrong, you will see that what is considered uh, uh, socially acceptable as the right and as the wrong changes from time to time. What does our prevailing culture of the world say today about what is right and wrong? It, most of those things started developing um, in its infancy, uh, I guess in a very public and legislated way from the 60s and 70s. And it's only today that you see it becoming really full-blown, normalised in culture. And so you will see throughout human history, okay, right and wrong has always changed. It, if, it, if it is always changing and we have an unchanging God, then who's been setting right and wrong? It has been us. Knowledge of good and evil. Adam and Eve, taking of it. Now, you may hear some people describe, especially preachers, sometimes we call it that they rebelled against God. 
Uh, it's not wrong, okay? But rebel maybe is a little bit like jumping one or two steps, right? It's like they didn't just flat out rebel straight away. Like, I'm rebellious. I want to fight you straight away, right? They weren't. She saw that it was good for the eyes, you know, for the taste, right? And for gaining wisdom, she was seduced and Adam thereafter seduced into the idea that if I have this, I can determine. I can determine what is my standards for how I should live my life. And that's why I call it, uh, at least I help you to understand knowledge of good and evil along the lines of self-determination. Now then, both eyes, right, of them were open and they knew they were naked, right? And they sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. Then the man said to his wife, then the man and his wife, they heard the sound of Yahweh Elohim, right? Walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And they hid from Yahweh Elohim among the trees in the garden. Immediately, shame, guilt kicks in, okay? They've done something wrong. They know they've done something wrong. How many of you, you have a dog uh, um, who's, who, when they do something wrong and you go into a room and you look at them and they're like, uh, they left like a puddle somewhere. They're like, right? It's a bit like that, okay? They immediately started hiding, right? When they realized they were naked, that awareness, right? And so awareness of nakedness, okay? Um, they hid from each other. They sowed leaves, they covered their bodies, and then they went into the leaves to hide from God. Let's move on. So Yahweh Elohim called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now, it's not as if God doesn't know this, where they are. He's omniscient. He knows where they are. He's asking because he wants the guy to answer from the bush, right? Uh, um, so that he can, he can name where he is. And so he does. He says, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. Who told you you were naked, Right? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, She did it! It's her. She did it. It's her. It's not me. It's her, right? Right? And then Eve said, It's me. I, I'm the problem. It's me, right? No, she didn't, right? She said, It did it! Right? Snake did it, right? So he said, Woman gave it, the woman that you gave to me to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit. I ate Yahweh Elohim as a woman. What have you done? She said, Serpent deceived me, right? Serpent deceived me and I ate. So the blame game, the refusal to take accountability it wasn't me, it was her, right? It wasn't me, it was it, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's it, right? That's the problem, right? And now, so I want you to see that that starts kicking in. Shame, guilt, hiding, blame, right? All of that kicks in literally within three paragraphs. It's all in there. It's a bit like the, the, the myth of Pandora's box, right? Um, that uh, last week I talked to you a little bit about Greek uh, creation stories. Part of all that folklore includes Pandora's box, right? Pandora opens a box that she's not supposed to open. It unleashes all the horrors of the world. And quite literally, you're seeing here the biblical kind of like comparison of that. So what happens, right? God pronounces consequences for all of them, okay? Consequences for all of them. I put the text on the side so that on your text you can fact check me. I always do this when there's a lot uh, to go through. But the consequences are being spelled out first for the serpent. Number one, cursed more than all the animals is this serpent. Number two, right? You shall move on your belly all the days of your life and eat dust all the days of your life. Now, um, eat dust doesn't quite literally mean like eat like dust, okay? Because elsewhere you will see the word dust used um, in more complex ways, like how we were created out of the dust, okay? And uh, now, I'm not going to go, going to go into that, not really super relevant anyway, but you shall have hostility with the woman. So you and the woman, the first point of contact, right? Two of you, right? And the blame between the two of you, you shall have hostility with her. Her offspring will have hostility with your offspring. And her offspring, now this is important, will strike your head and you will strike his heel. 
Okay, so there'll be enmity, there'll be hostility between the generations of Eve's sons and daughters, okay, um, and the generations of the serpent's future progeny. That's the consequences. Cursed. Okay, bear that in mind. Huh? Next one, consequences for the woman. You will have your, in, your labor pains, intensifying of labor pains. Or rather, he says quite literally the exact words is to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Now, the painful effort, the word here um, does not just mean physical pain. Okay, so I want you to know, okay, that it's not just physical pain. Okay, the word actually in Hebrew translates also into grief. So, with grief, with sorrow, with toil, with pain, you shall bear children, okay? And I let you exegete for yourself to some extent what bear children means because it can just be the actual labour, okay? It can be maybe, I don't know, maybe metaphorically even just a bit wider than that, okay? I'm not teaching that. I'm just saying it's there for interpretation. And then it says here, your desire will be for your husband. If you read the ESV, it says your desire will be contrary to your husband. You're like, eh? Huh? So which one is correct? NIV says your desire is for your husband. ESV says your desire is contrary to your husband. It's because the original Hebrew says, your man, your impulse, he shall rule over you. That's it, right? So the, so the Hebrew is quite abstract. It says that your man, your desire, your impulses. So it just leaves it as kind of two expressions like that. And so what does it, what is it trying to say though? What we can approximate what it's trying to say is that there is going to be a, a, a relational uh, um, kind of desiring a desiring, a desiring may or may not match. And I think therein, in the matching or unmatching, I think it's in, in the unmatching of those desires or the required or unrequited uh, uh, um, desires, okay, he shall rule over you in spite of that, okay. And frankly, now, it's man, it's woman, but here in this context, it will be desire for husband, so it's in a marital context. But I do want to uh, point out that ever since the fall, men have been acting in dominating and in sinful uh, um, uh, uh, use of power, physical strength, or whatever else that men appear to be born with, okay, in order to subjugate and to use women as for sometimes objects, sometimes uh, um, whatever else to benefit their needs. And as a church, we have to turn this around, right? As a church, we have to turn there. We cannot tolerate uh, um, that, kind of, that kind of very heavily sexist, patriarchal, misogynistic way that men treat women, you know, that does not treat women as equals taken out from your ribcage, so to speak, to be the structural, architectural thing that supports your shared life together. This is the first hint of that. Consequences for men. By the way, God does not curse the man and the woman. Sometimes we have been taught, maybe wrongly, that the woman was cursed with birth pains, right? And man was cursed with something else, right? They are not cursed here. The serpent was cursed. There's no mention of curse over the woman. And I think it's important for us to know, okay? Is that my phone? I'm just scared that it's my phone. It's not. Okay. Um, um, so it's important you know, right? It's not, men and women are not cursed, okay? And their birthing is not a curse, okay? It was always going to be. Now, the man also had consequences. The ground is cursed because of you. So the ground is cursed, but you will eat ground through painful labor. It will produce thorns and thistles. You will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow, right? The land will not produce the way it's supposed to produce anymore. Last week, I said that in the fall of, of, of Adam and Eve, so the entire creation also goes into some kind of fall. And therefore, therefore, today we have a fallen, we have a fallen nature through Adam. In fact, all of creation um, is tied up, bound together in the fallenness of Adam and Eve. And you saw that in the way the earth was cursed, the land was cursed because of what Adam did. 
right? Now, we're going to go from having us having a fallen nature to show you how God restores us through Jesus, okay? So that's the main structure of my sermon today. I will, if I can, take a detour, okay, before I go from here to A to B to talk a little bit about evil and extreme evil in our world and therefore I need to plow through fast. We have a fallen nature through Adam and the whole of created order has in fact fallen. Our hearts are sick. Sick almost beyond repair. I say almost because only Jesus can give us a new heart. Okay? Sin enters the world through one man, right? We'll talk a little bit about that. And our self-determination will lead us into repeated cycles of self-destruction. At the end of it, we cannot sustain righteous living by ourselves, no matter how hard we try. Let's jump into the first two of these points. The created order has fallen and our hearts are sick. How many of you have watched the Disney film Moana? Raise your hands. Moana people, all the way up, all the way up. So few! Oh my word, you really have to go watch Moana. I love Moana. We walked out from the cinema, I was like, I love this film, right? Now, Moana really is a parable of the decay of the created order, right? And so the film opens with um, kind of like a mother god type of mother earth god, like a Gaia of sorts. Her name is Tefiti, right? And and at the beginning, everything is beautiful, pristine, and working in great order. Then the demigod uh, uh, Maui steals the heart of Tefiti. Okay, so he does something, he violates the perfect order of the world. You can see the, 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 the correlation. He steals the heart of Tafiti, and thereafter, in the land uh, um, that, that Tafiti is in, okay, everything starts to go to ruin, right? The coconuts come out charred and, and parched, right? They're all blackened as if they were burned. The fishermen come back with no fish. They can't catch anything. Created order has gone wrong. Something really bad has happened because something Something really bad is happening because something really bad had happened earlier. Do you see what's happening in our own real world? It's such a parable. Moana is a daughter of the chief, right, in, on this island. And she has to decide, will I take up this, this heroine's mission, you know, to go and try to restore the heart back to Tafiti. I love this little screenshot of her holding the oar, asking herself, as it were, these are my tools to rescue the world, right? Do I have what it takes? How far will I go, right? And so she does, she gets into the boat, she sails, she goes through all kinds of a typical hero narrative, right? You sail away from your hometown, you know? You were sheltered, you're not sheltered anymore, and now you go through all kinds of storms, okay? She encounters Maui, who deceives her, but she has to overcome uh, uh, um, the deceptive Maui. She has to overcome uh, uh, a crab, uh, uh, demon monster crab uh, uh, kind of creature that is horrible lots of gold and jewels. It appears almost as if um, this, this uh, crab monster, its name is Tamatoa, it appears almost as if Tamatoa is like a random villain just thrown in, you know. But if I think that the creators at Disney is making us ask ourselves whether today all of these people who are like the dragons hoarding pots of gold, whether they are connected to the destruction of something that was pure and good from the start. Eventually, Moana has to battle a lava monster as well. Like, it's the final boss mode. She encounters the lava monster. You know, they come face to face. But instead of destroying the lava monster, you know, she plants a loving kiss on the lava monster. Of course, if you are a Disney princess, you know the power of a well-timed kiss, right? And immediately, Lava Monster starts to crack. And what is the Lava Monster actually? It is the restored Tefiti, right? Of course, Moana restores the heart back to Tefiti and the whole world comes back into perfect order again. This is a parable for how sin and fallenness enters the world through the violation 
of one party, right? Adam and Eve, right? As a, as a couple, they violated God's original perfect order from Eden to destruction. And now we are all living somewhere between here, right? And here, right? Like everything has just gone absolutely bonkers. Wars, people killing people, people swindling each other. It's all crazy. Some people are hoarding goods, you know, other people are deceiving each other. There's natural storms, there's crazy things going on. And then, of course, right? The way our story resolves is that Jesus stares at the face of pure evil and overcomes it. What? With love for us by dying on the cross. And after this, all of the earth, we are actually living here. We are living here. Okay? All of the world is being recreated anew again. We are part of the recreation of God, recreating a new world around us. And that is where you and I come in today. That's where the church comes in today. And really, that last slide, right, is New Jerusalem, right? Uh, it's a picture of the perfect order being restored back again. For now, though, our hearts are sick and in need of healing. No matter how hard we try, we desire after good things, it keeps falling apart. We start out with good intentions, you know, and eventually it goes into decay. Now, last year, when I was preaching about about Paul going to Athens. How many of you remember Paul going to Athens? He meets the Stoics and Epicureans, right? How many of you remember this? Like, most of you are like, oh my gosh, I have hardly any memory. So Paul meets um, two different groups of Greek philosophers. The Stoics are the people who say, loosely speaking, pursue virtue, okay? Live self-controlled lives, okay? And accept hardships, you know, as a fact of life, right? And then, of course, the Epicureans are quite the opposite philosophically speaking, they're like, pursue pleasure because there will be no cosmic accountability and gods or the gods uh, uh, will not come to interfere. They're very far away. They're like the parent who goes away on holiday and you have the whole house to party, right? Okay? And so, uh, I'm oversimplifying it, of course. And so, uh, this, uh, around the time when I was preparing for that sermon last year, I came across this quotation by a historian of philosophers. He, his name is Will Durant and Will Will Durant said, a nation is born Stoic and dies Epicurean. A nation is born with a strong, I'm going to read, right? In the beginning all of, of all cultures, a strong religious faith conceals and softens the nature of things, gives men courage to bear pain and hardship patiently. At every step, the gods are with them. At last though, men begin to doubt the gods. They mourn the tragedy of knowledge. Remember? The tragedy of being able to decide for yourself what is right, the self-determining uh, knowledge. And they seek refuge in every passing delight. Start of Stoic, end of Epicurean. After David comes Job. After Job, Ecclesiastes. I thought this was so beautiful, so so well woven together, right? Because why? Why am I showing you this? Because if a nation begins stoic, if a nation begins with a strong moral principle, strong ethical idea, this is who we are. We are founding fathers with our founding charters and this is our bright light for the whole world. This is who we are. And then over time, a nation degenerates and decays into self-indulgent pleasures, okay, um, that looks like in b b born stoic dies epicurean right our hearts are sick no matter how well our intentions at the start it will decay i am not pinpointing any nation all nations begin their lives with high uh, um, and all of us do as well in fact our years are like that right january is very stoic and then december is just epicurean all the way it's like oh forget it like, i just just and now i want to go to sleep november first he's like i want to go to sleep and wake up in january right um, okay all right our hearts are sick creator order has fallen now sin has entered the world through one man now, here's the thing, right? It always made me feel like it was extremely unjust that the whole world um, uh, fell through one man. Like this Adam, I find him, I beat the life out of him, right? Because, but, but you know what? You know, and of course, it looks like this, right? Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, says Romans 5, verse 12, death enters through sin. In this way, death spread to all people because all sin. So, 
this is a picture um, I, that I've drawn for you, okay? This is like Adam. Through Adam, Adam is the gateway, right? Through Adam, that little small bit in the funnel, through Adam, sin enters humanity. And once it enters humanity, it goes through all the, all, all the genealogies, all the peoples, right? It just spreads, it goes public. Right, uh, from one person it goes. Right? You can, I mean, post COVID, we can think of it this way. He's a super spreader, right? Okay, and then because of him, we all can, right? Okay, so sin, fallenness, decay, death, brokenness, that sick heart that I talked about, all of that is from one man. Gosh, right? Imagine the remember Malaysia's first super spreader, yeah. Quite sad, right? Because he, he actually died during the COVID time, right? Um, Adam is the world's uh, uh, super spreader. Now, the knowledge of good and evil that leads to our self-determination. I decide what is right, what is wrong. This, of course, eventually becomes self-destruction, okay? Because guess what? We are some of the poorest people to govern ourselves. The only problem is we don't have a lot of other options, so we try to govern ourselves, but we're not very good at it. We make promises to ourselves every year in January, and we break those promises after, during Chinese New Year, right? And we are not good at doing this. We self-destruct. And the Bible story will show you that through self-determination, the people of God kept on self destroying, right? You will see that through the stories of Noah and the stories of Babel, that humankind was just drawn, magnetically drawn towards self-destructive behaviours. And God would have to reset. And you'll hear that next week, right? And then when He resets, He restarts everything and He tries and He gets, I mean, don't speak, say this, I say this humanly, okay? It's not as if God is like trying and failing, right? That's not God, right? But He gives us a chance again, right? And then we manage to uh, allow, you know, all kinds of jealousy and all kinds of domination of each other, all these things creep in again, you know, until it can fully degenerate and then God resets again through another king and so on, right? The nation of God's people will go through reset and chaos and finally collapse, you know, and, and really, when you get to the apocalypse, it gets really grisly and bad as well. Why? Because we are prone to self destructive behaviours. We think that we are going to be the bright shining lights, that beacon of moral guidance for ourselves, that I can lead my life and most of the time, you know, we lead ourselves into very horrific places. And as a result of that, all our efforts to sustain righteous living just seems to go wrong. Right? Romans 7 is a real exposition on this. This is one of the slides. I'm giving it to you, okay? I, I can't go very deep dive into this, okay? Because I'm brushing past it. Romans 7 essentially is a description of a sinful person, like any one of us, saying, I try to do good, but it feels like there's another power inside me that is overriding my desire to do good and it does all the bad. So I want to do good, but I don't do good. All the good that I want to do, I don't do. All the bad that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And then he ends on saying, right, I do not do the good that I want, the evil I do not want to do, I keep on doing. Now if I do what I don't want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me. There's a fallen nature in in every one of us that seems to like constantly override some of our better judgment and takes over us. Remember, the heart is sick and sin has entered the whole world, brokenness has entered the whole world through one man and therefore his final cry, wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Wretched man, wretched life. Gosh, if this is your life, Romans 7 is your life, absolutely hopeless. Thank God there's a Romans 8. Go home and read it, okay? So we have a fallen nature through Adam. And then of course, the, the second big box, God restores us through Jesus is in many ways Romans 8. But I want to take a quick detour and talk about evil 
the nature of evil and the nature of extreme evil. Now, I spent some time preparing for this, thinking about the difference between a fallen nature and a sinful nature. Okay, just one minute now, less than a minute, 30 seconds. Send to the person next to you and try to see if you can you know, tease this one. What's the difference between the fallen nature and a sinful nature? Ah, cell group time. Talk to each other. Yeah, talk to each other. What's the difference between fallen nature and sinful nature? So I see some of you all discussing this, right? Sinful nature would be the nature in us that disposes us towards sinful acts, okay? So we are disposed towards actions and behaviours that are sinful, right? Um, now, a fallen nature is much bigger. It's like an umbrella term that describes how everything is in decay. Therefore, dying is not a sinful act. But dying comes outside of that Venn diagram, right? It, dying comes under the larger idea that we live in a fallen world. Death is part of a fallen world. Decay is part of a fallen world, right? Cancer is part of a fallen world. The earth being entirely disrupted, yielding thorns and thistles, fallen world, right? Earthquakes and volcanoes and some of these groanings that the world goes through, the, the actual planet Earth goes through, is part of a fallen world. So fallen nature is the nature where everything is in some ways just broken, breaking, and no longer working correctly. And the sinful nature in us is a subset of a larger fallen condition. All right. Now, the next few slides I'm going to show you is actually some of the extra content that I started geeking out on, okay? I started with the hypothesis, right? Is the New Testament more interested in external behaviours, you know, and does it preach more about sin? And could it be that the Old Testament is more interested in a high-level fallen nature thing uh, and talking more about how everything is decaying, right? Because I was thinking of Ecclesiastes, thinking of the Psalms, and thinking about how Paul in the New Testament is always giving lists of sins, right? Like uh, flee morality, immorality, you know, uh, uh, don't, don't, don't do this, don't do that. And that was my hypothesis. Very quickly, right? The Greek text has a lot of frequent words on sin, very infrequent, one in 1,700 compared to one in, eight, eight, one in 800 words on, on, uh, on evil, right? So sin being behavioral stuff and evil being conditional stuff, right? And then conversely, Hebrew text has a lot less frequent uh, mentions of sin and more frequent uh, 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 mentions of evil. Therefore, is it possible that our New Testament mentions sin more? Yes. Okay, it does. Hebrew text mentions evil more? Yes. So is the New Testament more behavioral, more prescriptive about observable lifestyle things? You have to decide, right? Um, and is the Hebrew text more, uh, spends more time observing the nature of humanity? Maybe, right? Um, and why is that helpful? It's helpful only to this, this extent, that when we read our Bibles, I want to encourage you to know your whole Bible. That's why we are doing this whole Bible series, right? That when you go through both the Hebrew text and the Greek text, you will see the complete picture of how the fallen nature gives birth to sinful nature that gives birth to sinful acts, okay? Now, I want to show you the scale of good and evil. We all agree that some, pe some things are more evil than others, right? And some things are more righteous than others, right? Now, if you posit that there is something more evil than the next, right, then... Really, I know sometimes we, um, the, the more westernized world will make us feel a bit silly for believing in such a thing as a devil, right? Like, oh, how can you believe in a devil oh, with horns and, you know, and all that, right? And then we feel like, oh, Christian feel much, I'm so stupid like that, right? Have you felt that? Ever felt that? No? No, no one feels it? I'm the only one who feels it. Or that? Right? Now, if you posit that there is more evil than and less evil, naturally you have to posit that you, you will ultimately, there is something that is perfectly good. If there is more righteous, there is absolutely righteous. And if there is absolutely righteous, that righteous is God. If you believe that there is less, uh, uh, more evil and more evil, then you believe that there is something that is absolutely pure evil. And if you believe in that, then you believe in something that we call the devil. And if this is your belief system, then yes, you're not a Taoist, right? Because a Taoist believes in the yin and yang idea that in all that is righteous, there is a speck of 
black and in all that is white and in black there is a speck of good right or something along those lines and we believe that god is perfectly good the scriptures teach us that there is literally almost like this an apologetics discussion with the taoist right there is not a speck of evil in god right and i think that's important because the converse needs to be dealt with we sometimes wonder whether there is a speck of good left in the devil and and a lot of movies these days, probably starting from, starting from the Star Wars prequels, right? Where you see Darth Vader and it retells the origins of how Vader became Vader and he makes Vader to be very sympathetic. Like you, you watch and you go like, oh, I understand why he's like this, right? And then you watch Malevolent and you go, oh, I understand why she's like that. And then you watch like literally film after film after film these days are taking the villain Cruella, right? Oh, I, 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 now I know what produced a woman like that. And it sympathizes the villains that are told on screen. I understand, okay? Film genre history will go through these cycles one. It's normal, right? But what it does for us in the way we think is that we no longer think in categories of absolute evil and, and, and good. We humanize the villains. And guess what? It's one of those cultural things that just gets into your system. After a while, you're going to start to wonder whether you should be humanizing Satan as well. Right? Maybe he's not all bad. Maybe there were really bad conditions that shaped Satan to become the person he is. And then suddenly you become a little empathetic, sympathetic towards him. You know what? No, we don't do that. Okay? We don't do that. It's okay to do it with stories, with heroes and anti heroes, right? But this is not the way the Christian thinks. You can sympathize and humanize the earthly villains, but there is an absolute darkness that cannot be sympathetic at all. It desires only contrary to the absolute good and God. Now, how do these powers work? Because I've laid out for you that you have your will and you have your own fallen nature. And then there are all these hantus that are trying to catch out you, right? Okay? And how do these two things relate, right? Whose fault is it when you do something wrong? Maybe I can phrase it that way. Because when I was a new Christian, I used to, because you have to forgive people, ma. So in order to forgive people, I used to say, I know I got a cheat or how to forgive people. I just tell myself, she has a demon, right? <laughs> oh, this person treat me so bad. Never mind, she has a demon. It's not her fault. It's, it's demon's fault. So I can forgive her, right? It makes it easy, but it takes away personal accountability. And so every time I want to think about this, I bring up, okay, I'll show you this, a girl like this, okay? Um, she's got her own will. She's autonomous. She's self-determining, I suppose. And then there's a hantu and a Jesus, you know? Now, ever heard the expression super spiritual? Hyper spiritual, super spiritual. Let me help you define super spiritual here in Suhebelo Church, okay? So other people can define it other ways. This is how we we'll define it, okay? You are super spiritual when all you consider are the spiritual factors and you neglect actual human factors, okay? So let's say um, uh, your son fails the exam, right? And then you got house cleansing now, right? Fine. Oh, here got Ang Pao with dragon in his room. This is causing him to fail in his exams, right? And then you go, oh, he got this fantasy storybook. Inside got gnomes and dragons, satanic, right? And no, look, I'm not, I'm not putting that down. I'm saying that we do these things to the neglect of human factors. Hey, uncle, actually, uh, what's the education uh, atmosphere like in your house? What do you mean? I watch TV, auntie watch TV, and my son every day play games so bad he should study more. It's like, uncle, maybe you need to make some human level adjustments to the way you do things. So there is always a human level accountability and there are always spiritual realities that are in play you are super spiritual if you only consider the spiritual elements you don't consider the human element. you never it never crosses your mind to think of the human factors at play you only think of the spiritual factors now of course the reverse is true right you are skeptic materialist humanist you don't have to memorize those is right um, when you only consider the human factors so so, um, uh, let's say you kena tekan at night, you know, and then like, oh, you can see everything, but you can't speak, you can't voice, you want to shout, but nothing happens, you know. It's like, oh, 
I suppose you like sleep. Maybe you need to get some medicine. You know, I suppose you need a holiday. Uh, maybe you're under a lot of stress. And that's not wrong. That is not wrong. And then like, you suddenly see like something moving across your room. And it's like, oh, um, maybe I need, maybe I'm, 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 my mind is playing tricks on me. You know, you're hearing voices and like, oh, my mind is definitely playing tricks on me. I need rest. Maybe I need to, you know, see, uh, get treatment. Maybe I need to, something else. So you're always only considering the human factors. You're not considering spiritual factors. Now, why is it important? Because a Christian with balanced theology acknowledges the full force of both human and spiritual factors in play. Why is this important? Because in the fallen world, and as people living in the wake of the fall, we have fallen nature and sinful nature. We are accountable for our bad decisions. Okay, we are accountable for our bad decisions. At the same time, there is a spiritual reality that we cannot see and it's very hard to assign the, 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 the quotient of how much that is influencing us, but we know it does influence us. So evil, and then there is extreme evil, and they do interplay with us. And I'm going to wrap up very quickly by showing you how God restores us through Jesus. And so that you can see that every way in which the fallen world is fallen, Jesus comes and brings a response to every single one of us. He, the created order will now be restored. God will give us new hearts. Sin, which entered through one man, will be expunged by one man as well. And then trusting God rather than self-determination will lead us to life and the Holy Spirit will thereafter sustain righteous living, right? Where do we see this? The whole of creation waits with eager expectation. If you are someone who is passionate about the environment, you are someone who is passionate about sustainability of our world, I want you to know that the Bible has something to say about it. And the Bible is not just pillage, plunder the earth, you know, and, and, and vote a certain way, right? It's not, right? The Bible actually says that the whole of the created order waits in eager expectation for what? The sons and daughters of men to come alive, to come alive in, in, in the renewal of what God is doing as His kingdom invades. Sons and daughters of Christ are renewed in their thinking. We are renewed in our way of living. And as we are are renewed, the whole of the creation, created order is approaching the day it itself gets redeemed and renewed so that when all of this passes on, creation is renewed and reaches its climax when New Jerusalem comes down and you see the river of life, you see the trees planted in the city whose leaves are to the healing of the nations. All of creation now groans, groans and sometimes I see Richter scale above 10, I hear the groaning of the world, right, of the created world just crying out, um, um, saying, be renewed, O oh man. We are waiting. We fell because of you. Remember? Cursed be the land because of what Adam has done. We fell because of you. Now we are waiting for you to be redeemed so that we can be redeemed along with you. Those who are in Christ Jesus shall have no condemnation. Romans 1. The earth following on the heels of the sons of Adam and Eve. That's all of us, right? Entering into Christ our vessel, the, the, the Noah's Ark, right? And then Christ in Christ, no condemnation. Amen? And so in this way, the earth will be renewed. Yahweh will renew our sick hearts. It says in Deuteronomy, so this is not a New Testament idea. In Deuteronomy, it says that Yahweh, your God, will circumcise your hearts. So we'll talk about this more when we talk about Exodus. But God has never been interested primarily in giving you a set of rules and laws to follow. He's always from the start wanted to renew your heart. Circumcise your heart, says God. In Jeremiah 31, He says that this covenant I will make with the house of Israel, right? I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. So from the law being written on tablets of stone, He's now going to put it deep inside them. And it's going to be written on their hearts, inscribed in the place where the emotions and the will and the decision and all those things come from. God's going to write His 
His law, His ways on their hearts. And Ezekiel 36 brings this to a culmination. He says that, I will take out that heart of stone from inside you and I will give you a new heart. So in this sense, when you speak in Ezekiel's language, it's not wrong to say our hearts are sick beyond repair. Because the picture Ezekiel gives is that stony heart, he's not even going to soften it. He's not even going to repair it. He's going to give you a new heart. He's going to take out your old heart and give you a new heart. And starting last year, I started to pray this way for myself. I stopped saying uh, um, all the time, God softened my heart, even though it's not a wrong prayer. Okay, it's not a wrong prayer to say, God softened my heart. But some days I pray it this way. I say it as, God, I have a wretched heart. Give me a new heart. Give me a new heart. And God says back, Behold, see, I am doing a new thing. Amen? Amen? How many of you, you want a new heart? You want a new heart. Amen? I do. I want a new heart. I, every day I want my heart to be renewed and God says that my faithfulness is new every morning. Amen? Why? Because even as Adam was the cause for sin to enter the world, the gift is not like the trespass. If for one man's trespass many died, how much more has the grace of God uh, um, uh, and the gift which comes through the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflowed to the many? What does this mean? It means that all of the sin and fallenness and decay which leaked into the world and has spread out, is going to, like a reverse funnel, be channeled back down to one point all over again, the second Adam. This is, it, will, it is going to all be channeled back down to Jesus. And so this is Jesus at the cross. Sometimes we find it hard to understand how Jesus on the cross can contain all the sins of humanity. It had to be that way because through one man, all of sin entered into the world, Pandora's box-like, and therefore all of this needs to be recontained back into one man and that man is Jesus. And because all of sin and fallenness and decay has been dealt with in Jesus Christ, we can all now enter through Christ into righteousness, into renewal, and into everlasting life. This is what the journey of sin through one man to everybody, back from everybody to one man, and now in Christ, we have righteousness, renewal, and everlasting life. And it says in the Word of God, for just as through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also through one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Amen? And so, my friends, even as we say that our hearts are broken, God is going to renew us through one act of trespass of the taking of the fruit and then one act of obedient righteousness on the cross. I want you to see two trees. We stood at the first tree and we saw coiled upon that wooden branch, right? The serpent. And the serpent enticed us seduced us and there we died right and I want you to see the second tree not a literal tree and your New Testament actually uses the word tree for the cross once right and it's a metaphor of the first tree we stood before that second tree with the son of man nailed to it and he draws us into forgiveness he draws us into a relationship of love where we turn our eyes toward Him and live. Indeed, from now on, if self-determination leads to destroying ourselves, when we turn our will to God, He brings us abundant life. And remember Romans 7, I try so hard, I try so hard, I try so hard, but I cannot some other power keeps coming out of me. Now we have the Holy Spirit. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, says Romans 8, the next passage, right? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Church, I want to invite the worship team to come on stage. And I want to bring us to a place where we can just turn our hearts, turn our eyes, Actually, I want us to just pause on this picture for a moment, the two trees. Because we spend most of our lives 
standing at the foot of the first tree, looking up on the seductive things of this world, and we repeatedly say yes to them. We keep saying yes to things that keep on harming us, keep on destroying us. We say yes and we make bad decisions. You know, I have a friend who said this thing to me. Um, he, he was counselling someone and that, that someone was making really bad choices with his life and no matter how many times he, my friend and other people came around to help him out, get him a job and he quit that job get some other job then get fired from that second job you know and, and frustrating to help that guy and in, in my friend's frustration and I don't think it's an untrue thing I'm still wrestling with what he said he told this brother bro Jesus can save you but Jesus can't save you from your stupid decisions wow like I'm going to have to think about that for a while And I think it's not entirely without merit because if you keep standing before that first tree and you keep your eyes fixed on the seductive things of this world, Psalm 119 has a line that says, turn my eyes away from worthless things. If you keep standing and putting yourself before that first tree and gazing upon the beauty of the material and the temporal and the fleshy, juicy things that are offered to you. I don't know how many rounds of stupid decisions you and I have to make before it reaches a point where Jesus just cannot reach us anymore because our hearts turn so stony that even if presented to us, we keep rejecting Him after that. But I'll leave that one hanging because I think this is happening at the level of your personal will and your personal place of decision. All I want you to know is if you were to turn around you, you will see the second tree. And the second tree, wood, planks, beams, not a serpent coiling on it, but the Son of Man nailed into it. And the gaze of the first is deceitful, deceptive, seductive. The second one, his eyes are so bludgeoned, my friends. He can't barely look through all the blood and the, and the swollenness to see you. But those are the eyes of love. Those are the eyes of self-sacrifice. Those are the eyes of one who is, who, who, for whom the entire fallen nature is being compressed onto that one man so that we can have righteousness, renewal, and everlasting life. Which tree are you standing on today? Whose tree are you gazing up at? For those of you who have never given your life to Jesus, You've never stood before this second tree, the cross of Jesus Christ, to give your life to Him. I'm going to say a prayer. I want you to repeat with me. Lord Jesus, I see You. And You are beautiful. Bludgeoned but beautiful. And I stood at other trees for my whole life. And they've offered me false dawns and empty promises. But today, I stand before you. I gaze upon you. I see you now. It's as if I've seen you my whole life, but today I see you for the first time. And I give my life to you. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior for the rest of my days. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. And all of God's people say, Amen. All of God's people say, Amen. It's today a day of celebration. Amen. Today is a day of celebration. Turn to someone and say, Today is a good day. Today is a day of celebration. Amen. All right.